Hi, folks, and welcome. So I'm uh, really excited to have you all joining us today. Uh, not sure where in the world you are calling in from, but where I am, it is really sunny and uh, very hot. And so uh, we really thought here at AANMC that this topic would be appropriate to help folks navigate the summer, uh, things like sunscreen and skin health, and just you know make sure that everybody is doing it as safely as possible. So uh, we are going to, whoops. Uh, just run through a little uh, housekeeping before we get started here. So uh, you all are in listen only mode. Uh, if you have any questions during the course of the webinar, please use the Q&A function. Uh, Joanna here from AANMC is uh, going to be womaning the chat box and the Q&A area. And um, we, we are hopefully we'll be able to get all of your questions answered. Uh, this session is going to be recorded as all of them are and up on our website as soon as we're able to get that done. If you do have any questions uh, now or after, after the fact, please email us at info at aanmc.org. And so with that, we're going to get started. So uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I have not always lived in sunny places. Um, did my undergrad in uh, University of Miami. That was a sunny place. Um, and uh, the doc my doctorate of naturopathic medicine at SCNM, another sunny place. Um, but then I headed out to the Midwest and I was uh, in South Dakota for a number of years. I completed my master's in public health at Des Moines University. Uh, I've gotten my a certificate in association management for managing associations like this one uh, out of AS. AE in DC. Um, and I, I'm on a number of nonprofit boards and have been over the years. Um, but I recognize the power of work life balance. And so part of that work life balance for me is a garden and digging in the dirt when I can and uh, getting outside hiking and dancing and music and, and all the things that make life whole. So uh, with that, we're going to get started on uh, what we'll be talking about, what I'll be talking about today. So sun safety, uh, sunscreen additives, skin and eye health, how to check your own skin, uh, you know, empower yourself, um, and then a few key takeaways to enjoy your time outside. So to sun or not to sun, that is the question. Uh, going a little Shakespeare on us today. Um, so I know there's a lot of controversy when it comes to sun. Uh, there are mixed messages. When you talk to uh, conventional dermatologists, when you talk to folks in, in the naturopathic world, uh, you know, it, it, it is very controversial. And I think it part of that is because there is no one size fits all answer. Um, how your skin responds to the sun, uh, your risk factors have so many different things that are at play, that it is really difficult to give one answer for everyone. And so today we're going to talk a, bit, a little bit about maybe some of those things that'll help you make heads and tails of this, make a little bit more sense out of it. Um, a little bit of sun is, is good. It is needed. Uh, it helps us synthesize vitamin D. How much that quantity really depends. It depends on so many things. It depends on the season, how much melanin you have in your skin, the geographic location, your altitude, your elevation, if you're around water. There, there are so many different types of uh, factors that play in. Um, sunlight exposure is also important for setting your circadian rhythm. So like a lot of folks will say, you know, first thing in the morning, make sure that you're getting sun on your face, sun, you know, uh, you know, just a little bit, just enough to kind of set that clock and let your body know this is morning. Um, and conversely at night, it's really important to get good darkness uh, to again, give your, your body a sense of, okay, this is day and this is night. And this is uh, going to signal your body to start to make hormones. So we're going to talk about how to do this safely. Um, there are a lot of different nuances to this, and some are going to be very dependent on you, your family history. And if you have any questions throughout the course of this, it really is best to not take medical advice from a 20 minute webinar on the internet, but to go to your doctor, see a naturopathic doctor uh, or a dermatologist or somebody who can help you navigate what's best for you. So this is definitely not intended to be medical advice or to uh, supplant any medical advice that you that may be appropriate for you. So conventional additives, uh, conventional sunscreens um, have a lot of 
a word salad. I, I always call it. It's like lots of different words in there and it can be overwhelming for folks. And so one of the things that, uh, you know, there are a few words that you should look out for. Um, and as you're looking at different types of sunscreens, uh, there are a few ones that I personally tend to avoid. Um, and we'll just talk about that and, and kind of run through things. So oxybenzone, avobenzone, um, there are additional studies needed uh, but there have been some preliminary research demonstrating that there is skin absorption of these chemicals, potential for endocrine disruption. So that's disrupting uh, the natural estrogenic properties in the body. Some will mimic estrogen uh, and, uh, and a potential for cancer risk. And so and it's also not very friendly to coral reefs. So if you're swimming in the ocean, if you're swimming in any body of water, uh, these chemicals are are probably better ones to leave off your skin, uh, just given what what is you know what is at play here. Um, the American College of Pediatrics recommends avoidance of oxybenzone in children. So you know they they're recognizing that there is the potential for some endocrine disruption, and they don't want to be introducing an endocrine disruptor uh, into a child's body if if there's the potential for that. Um, you know the, it's mixed about pregnant women, but again, you know if you're trying to be uh, on the safer side of things, there are a lot of other options for sun protection safely uh, that don't e even don't include chemicals. And we're going to talk about covering up too. Uh, so there are other there are other additives right now that are being studied for safety: uh, homosalates, actin uh, oxalates. Uh, you know, again. We're going to talk about a couple different alternatives and some options and the pros and cons. And so there are pros and there are cons to some of the natural ones and to uh, uh, some of the ones that are more conventionally available. So let's just talk a little bit about sunlight for a minute. So there are uh, sunlight is ultraviolet light. Uh, it comes from the sun. Shocker there. Uh, and these are wavelengths that basically penetrate the uh, the Earth's atmosphere until they come in contact with us, and so UVA is this longer wave wavelength that penetrates the thickest layer, the top layer of the skin, called the dermis. And um, unprotected exposure to UVA has been associated with premature aging, wrinkles. Um, there's this really famous picture. I didn't include it in the webinar, but there's this famous picture of this truck driver who, uh, you know, when you're driving a truck, there's one side of your body that is exposed to the window and there's the other side that's more internal to the car. And he literally has like like you drew a line down his face. One side of his face is excessively wrinkled than the, uh, the one that was closer to the window. And the other side is not as aged. And so, uh, you know, the, the window does not block that UVA light that comes in and is responsible for that aging of the skin. And so if you're concerned about aging, um, then you are going to want to reach for some types of sunscreens that are going to block A and B. Um, and so, uh, again, you know, just kind of thinking through all of the different facets here. So uh, UVB is shorter wavelength, and this one is the one that we think of with sunburn. And so it, it will burn that top layer uh, of your skin. UVB rays can play a role in developing skin cancer. So that's one that people tend to be more concerned with. Although UVA is also going to break down the collagen, it's going to, uh, you know, over time, be responsible for that aging of the skin, the loss of the elasticity, the things that you know we associate with older skin, wrinkling skin, and so on. Um, UVC light is predominantly pretty much blocked by the ozone layer. Um, it is present in some layers. It's used as a germicidal agent. We're not going to be talking about C today. So really, we're focusing on UVs A and B. So again, uh, the majority of this uh, UV light we have the ozone layer, <laughs> hopefully we'll continue to have the ozone layer. Um, and, uh, and we have this protection, but it doesn't do it all. So uh, if you are into, you know, going outside and in the, um, uh, if you are going out and you are in, let's see here. just going to get this full screen for y'all so you can see the slides bigger. So 
sorry about that. So, so if you are going to be outside or exposed to sunlight, uh, there are a few different ways that you can incorporate sunscreen or sun blocking into your life. So you have physical barriers uh, and that will be things that are um, going to physically block UVA and UVB. And so some of the natural sunscreens fall into that realm. So things like zinc and titanium dioxide uh, will be physical barriers. So they're actually going to create a barrier for the sun rays, the UV rays get getting into contact with your skin. Um, and then there are the chemical ones that we discussed, uh, the more conventional sunscreens that are going to change those uh, sun rays at your skin's level, diffusing the energy. And so, um, and then of course there's clothes. There are things like hats, hats and sunscreen or sun, you know, sun, sun visors and sunglasses and uh, UV protectant clothing, you know, some, some folks, and we're going to talk about some mis misunderstandings and misperceptions in a little bit, but not all clothing is, is created equally when it comes to sun blocking. Uh, and so, so anyway, um, different types of sunscreens we talked about the reef safe stuff earlier. Uh, so reasons for using natural sunscreens, better for the environment, a little bit friendlier. Um, some folks will have sensitive skin. So people who are experiencing eczema, psoriasis, rosacea uh, may have issues. And uh, let's see, I think we're having trouble with, with this share here. Sure. What's going on? Let's see. Is that better? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, so, <clears throat> so lots of lots of different reasons why uh, some people may choose natural components um, and also a lower total chemical burden on the body. And so, you know, we know that there is so much environmental exposure to various different chemicals that we cannot control. And so some folks like to, uh, you know, when there are things that they are able to control somewhat, uh, lower their chemical burden on their body. Um, so one kind of, you know, pro tip here is, uh, reading the expiration date. So I, I, I don't, I've never even, you know, up until recently thought to like, look at an expiration date on sunscreen, 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 you know, if it's in your beach bag, you know, okay, we'll use it another year. And, uh, and so there, there is uh, an expiration three years is about where you want your sunscreen age to be. So if it's any older than that, probably time to toss and get a new, new bottle. Um, the other thing that is an unregulated term that can be really misleading for folks is the word natural. Natural is not a regulated word. And so when you see natural, sometimes it's a marketing tool and it may or may not have anything to do with what's inside the product. So again, read labels, whether it's your food or your sunscreen. Okay, so some myths. So there are lots of myths when it comes to sun protection. And I know I heard so many of these growing up. Uh, you know, oh, all you have to do is avoid sun during 10 to two, you know, during the peak hours and, and you'll be okay. Um, not necessarily, again, going back to my earlier slides, depends on geography, depends on how close you are to the equator, depends on how, your altitude, all these different factors um, where there still is UVA exposure. Uh, another one is, oh, cloudy days don't require sun protection. And, uh, you know, but there is UVA light that does get filtered in through set through cloud, maybe not as much, not, not the same uh, frequency of it, but it does come through. Uh, a lot of folks, and I, I see this all the time where, you know, people say they're applying sunscreen and they'll put like the tiniest little, you know, dab of sunscreen on their, you know, on their, on themselves and think that they are protected. Uh, you know, a lot of folks will just apply it like a lotion and just kind of, you know, put on a light little layer and call it good. Um, and we're going to talk about how much you actually need, uh, according to dermatologists. So uh, another mis misperception, slight myth, there is some truth to this, but not as much as maybe we think, um, that sunscreen protects vitamin D absorption. And so it is going to block 
some depend, but again, this is going to be one of those quantity things. It, um, so, you know, if you've ever been out in a really sunny place and uh, you, you thought you did a really good job of, of applying sunscreen, and then you've got like, I know I, uh, this has happened to me before, where I'll have like strips of sunburn or, you know, you, you know very well the places that you missed uh, out, you know, at the end of the day. And so, you know, even when we're applying sun, sun protection, uh, often we're missing spots and, uh, or there might be various diff varying uh, the thicknesses of the sunblock that are, are over your skin. You know, if you were, you know, had a very thick layer across the entirety of your skin, uh, then yes, the other thing is you're going to have areas that are exposed by clothing. And so that clothing may or may not filter in all the sun rays. Um, and, you know, most folks, and again, this depends on your melanin, it depends on where you are. Um, but, you know, for vitamin D synthesis, you're going to need, you know, between 10, 20 ish minutes uh, per day of sun exposure to make that vitamin D synthesis. And so most folks are going to be getting, uh, you know, a level that is safe from, from that type of exposure. Um, however, that said, there are many people, approximately 30% of folks or more that are naturally vitamin D deficient. Um, we see vitamin D deficiency also in folks with higher levels of melanin in their skin. Um, and so it went in doubt, just go get checked. Uh, there are lots of different ways to acquire vitamin D. Uh, there are food sources like fish and eggs and uh, you know, lot, lots of ways of, of getting vitamin D in your diet and in supplementation. Vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. So if you're taking it internally, good idea to take it with a meal, especially a meal that has some fat in it so that it will be absorbed a little bit better. Uh, so another misperception is if I'm wearing sunscreen, I don't need to cover up. It's always, it's always a good idea to cover as much as you can, uh, you know, wear hats, wear clothing so that you, you have to put less chemical on your body, regardless of whether the chemical is a natural one or a not natural one. Um, one application is all I need. Uh, not so much, probably should be applying every two to three hours um, and more if you're swimming or sweating a whole bunch. Um, some folks, and I used to hear this, oh, well, if I use a tinted moisturizer or, you know, I, I've got sunscreen in my uh, foundation, I don't need to apply sunscreen. Uh, not, not so, you know, most folks are not applying uh, their foundation at the thickness that you would need for the actual real sun protection. And so it, it's a good addition, but it, it shouldn't be replacing. Um, and then the last one, and I've heard this a lot from my own family members is I don't need sun protection. I, you know, I'm, I'm Latina, I'm Latino. I don't need sun protection. I'm black. I, you know, and so, um, it, it is a misperception. And in actuality, when we talk about skin cancer, uh, there are, there are, it's, it's oftentimes harder for diagnoses to be made on darker skin because of the appearance of it, um, doctors training. Uh, you know, I, I even remember when I went to med school 20 years ago and there were very few, very limited books on skin presentations in darker melanated people. And so many docs just, you know, are not as familiar with um, how it presents in darker melanated folks. So, uh, Lots of myths, lots of things out there. So let's let's talk just for a moment about melanin. So what is melanin? Melanin is a pigment. It's in our skin. It's in our eyes, and it is responsible for that darker color. Uh, it's also responsible for changing color in in uh, exposure to sunlight. So this is what tans us. Uh, it diffuses some UVB rays. May protect against uh, against sunburn to a certain extent. Um, but it's not protecting that UVA, which remember, UVA was the one that is responsible for the elastic damage, the, uh, you know, the, the, the matrix of your skin. Um, and so you still can get skin damage. So um, it's not going to also protect from extreme sun exposure. Uh, folks may not realize Bob Marley, a very famous reggae star, had melanoma. Uh, my own dad, who was Afro-Cuban had melanoma. So, you know, very extreme sun exposure is not going to be protected. Uh, 
skin, scan, skin cancer survival rates, as I mentioned earlier, uh, have been demonstrated in research to be lower in people with darker skin, including African Americans, Asian Americans, Native Americans, Pacific Islanders. So um, we need better screening. We're going to talk about screening uh, and better awareness of the risks of skin cancer in all populations. Okay, so are you using enough sunscreen? So most folks apply just about 25% of how much they actually should be. Um, so most people are not. So about, uh, you know, if you're thinking about like the surface of your face, and some of this is going to depend on the size of your hands, the size of your face and all of that. But, uh, you know, if you're applying sunscreen to your face, you know, you're, you're looking at about this much, like, so, you know, about the, from, from your tip to your knuckle of uh, sunscreen, about a quarter teaspoon or so. Um, and you should be applying every two to four hours. Most folks don't do that. And so, you know, even if you, you know, started out your day with some sunscreen on, how many of us, you know, show of hands are actually reapplying, you know, very consistently throughout the day. Uh, so, and, and the studies on sun protection. So like SPF is a big question. What SPF should I use? Uh, most folks say 30 or above. Um, after that 30 mark, those extreme numbers, uh, the efficacy is, is there, but it isn't as substantive. Um, and so some people get this false sense of security, like, oh, I'm using SPF 5000. I don't have to apply any more sunscreen for the week. Um, and, and so not necessarily, like it still degrades. It still is, you're still sweating. You're still, your body is still interacting with it and breaking it down. So, uh, you know, sometimes folks in the dermatology world actually advise against the super, super high numbers, just because sometimes people have a false sense of security that comes with using those. Um, and so all of the the, the literature has been done with two milligrams uh, per millimeter squared of skin, which is a, a pretty substantial amount of sunscreen. And so again, most folks are just not using enough. <clears throat> so risk factors, uh, low, low concentrations of melanin, pale eyes and skin, your total exposure, how much are you out in the sun, uh, family histories of skin cancer, personal histories of skin cancer, and some medications like diuretics that can ex increase exposure risk. Um, so eye is the forgotten topic. Uh, you know, a lot of times people will think of protecting their skin. Now, protecting your skin, that said, uh, show of hands, how many of you put sunscreen on your ears, on the back of your neck, and on the backs of your hands, the dorsums of your hands, all the time. Lots of folks don't. So there are a lot of areas that we forget, and the eyes are another one of those. And so, you know, do you have good quality sunglasses? Uh, you know, oftentimes sunglasses will have, when you buy them, uh, either a, uh, you know, a, a little plaque on it that says UVA, UVB protection, or what have you. Um, if you get prescription sunglasses, you can have coatings added that are additional blockers for UV light. Um, and there are risks to the eyes for overexposure cataracts. Um, there are a number of different types of eye conditions that can happen from excessive eye exposure, from sun exposure to the eyes. So it's just a good idea to, uh, if you are going to be out in full sun, uh, to protect your eyeballs as well. So do I need to look like this in order to be protected? No, you don't. Uh, you know, I think that there, there are some misperceptions that, you know, you got to be covered head to toe. And again, you know, a little bit of sun exposure is okay, but this is all going to vary on, you know, are you working outside in a yard all day long? Are you, you know, what are you doing? And so covering up is a good option, especially if you're going to be outside for extended periods, um, just because you don't have to remember to, you know, keep, slathering on sunscreen, it's real easy. Um, but there are clothing that's made with UV blockers in it. And so um, that is a good idea if you are going to be getting like really, you know, a substantial amount of sun exposure to just kind of check what is the UV blockage on the clothing or make sure that it's not like a loose weave that isn't going to be blo blocking as much sunlight. So uh, prevention's best medicine, like I said, cover up. Uh, choose sunscreens with fewer chem chemical additives, reapply regularly, 
keep your skin healthy. So, you know, in naturopathic medicine, we talk a lot about prevention. And one of the things, our skin is our largest surface area part of our organs. And um, are you keeping it healthy? Are you moisturizing? Are you maintaining the integrity of your skin so it isn't dry and cracking and uh, and and so on. And so there is a kind of a naturopathic favorite to skin health, uh, which is called dry brushing. Um, and has anyone ever heard of dry brushing before? You can just raise hands if you have or haven't. So um, dry brushing is, uh, oops, where's the dry brushing slide? Dry brushing is, um, is a practice that it, it, it sounds like exactly what it is. And so um, what dry brushing does is it increases the lymphatic circulation in your body. Um, it helps to increase the circulation to your skin um, and kind of moves that lymphatic fluid out. And so there are a few different, a few tips to dry brushing. Um, one, you always want to kind of brush towards your heart. So if I were taking a brush, I would be starting with my fingertips and my hands and going toward my heart. Um, same thing if you're doing your legs, you start at your toes and feet and you move upward. And so you want to always kind of think that you're moving in toward the center. Um, you can use circular motions and, uh, you know, lighter pressure, you know, you don't want it to hurt, um, but the, the brush is going to be dry. So it's going to be like one of those, um, you know, ones that you would use in the shower that you see in the shower, except you're going to keep it dry. Um, and first thing in the morning is a good time to do this. Uh, cleaning your brush is important also, and then moisturizing and making sure that you are moisturizing after showers, you're moisturizing your skin. Uh, a favorite of mine, honestly, I, I don't like to use lots of crazy creams and stuff. I'm, I'm kind of a simple girl when it comes to uh, you know my skin. And so I, I keep a, a jar of coconut butter, uh, coconut oil in the shower, not in the shower because it's glass, but in, in the bathroom. And I'll use that coconut oil, uh, especially on my legs and stuff that tend to get really, really dry. And so, you know, just keeping your skin moisturized and healthy is a good strategy here. So I've gotten some, you know, some sun, uh, sun damage over the years, uh, that time in Miami and, and, uh, you know, various different times in my life where I was not quite as, as careful, uh, with sun exposure kind of thinking, oh, well, you know, I've got natural base tan and, you know, I'm, I'm naturally Latina. And so I, I don't need to protect myself as much. And so I have gotten some sun damage. So I've had various different skin checks over the years. I'm kind of meticulous about checking my skin from time to time because I do have a skin cancer history. Um, and so, uh, in my family, so, what do you do? So when you're looking at your moles, uh, the A, B, C, D, E's of your checklist. So one thing that you're going to look for, all of these, as you're looking at your moles, and you kind of want to get a, a sense of, you know, okay, what does my body look like? Where are the moles that are normal? And so that if there are new ones that come up, you're going to know that they're new. So when you are checking for moles that are new or are changing, here are a few of the steps you're going to look for. Asymmetry, so that is the, the mole is not like a nice perfect round circle. It's uneven in certain parts. Um, has the border changed? Is the border kind of getting squiggly in any spots? Is it changing colors? Is it turning red or black or green or blue? Is it, it any, any color changes to it? Has it changed in diameter? Is it getting larger? Um, and is it evolving? Like, is it changing, getting bumpy, getting scaly, bleeding? Um, so all of those things are things that you will kind of be checking through as you're looking at these different uh, areas on your skin. So there are three different types of skin cancers. The most common one uh, is uh, we have is basal cell, uh, squamous cell, and melanoma. Uh, melanoma is the one that's most associated with poor outcomes. Uh, basal and squamous cell, if they're caught early enough, can typically be removed. You can see that they are more superficial in the, la the layers of skin, so they are easier to kind of get out, especially if you catch them fast. Melanoma, though, as you can see, as it uh, burrows down into the deeper layers of skin, it's going to be trickier to get out. And that's why that one often can metastasize and spread uh, and, uh, and is the more associated with poor mortality morbidity. 
So here's what some of them look like. So, uh, you know, you, we all have moles. Most of us have moles. Uh, depending on your melanin and your skin, they may look a little different. Uh, basal cell is going to be kind of like this bumpy, uh, you know, it, it can be reddish. I recognize that all of these are, are less melanated skin examples here. Uh, squamous cell is going to have this typical kind of rolled border to it, uh, and it can bleed. Uh, and then melanoma, melano is the, the root term for black or dark. And so this, this is typically going to be a, a much darker pigmented uh, discoloration in the skin. So uh, again, we talked about the ABCDEs. So this is just a quick snapshot of that. So, so that is pretty much uh, where we are for the talk. I know that there are some questions that have been coming in. Um, so I'm going to uh, just kind of go through a couple things here now and then address some of the questions uh, that we have. So uh, as you can tell, I'm really passionate about talking about stuff like this. I love naturopathic medicine. I love the, the, the core of it that addresses the root of issues, um, helps people to have lots of options in their healthcare, uh, especially when they feel like they're out of choices and it looks at the whole person. So those are the things that I've always really valued about this field. Um, and so uh, I, I'm just excited for you all, uh, you know, considering this profession, looking into this, or even if you're just here just for some information, uh, I'm always available to talk to prospective students and share, you know, what, what it is I'm thinking about, what you're thinking about, and, uh, you know, and, and, and all of that. So happy to do that. I also like to share with students what I wish I knew uh, and, and lots of different things. So feel free to connect uh, as, um, as you're able. And, uh, if you want to stay in touch with us, we are on social media and, uh, and so happy to connect with you all, uh, on social or, uh, via email. And, um, and we've got a couple of, uh, AANMC events coming up. So, uh, in July, we are talking everything pain. So Dr. Terrence Manning is going to be with us uh, discussing naturopathic approaches to pain management. Uh, and then we are going to have the president of the Naturopathic Student Association, Mickey Bronner, speaking about a student's perspective on naturopathic medicine and maybe some tips and tricks for surviving naturopathic medical school. At the time of this webinar, Mickey will just have finished his board exams. And so uh, we, we, we gave him a little bit of a breather so that he would be able to uh, <laughs> be upright after board exams. So, so hopefully he'll have some really good tips and tricks for you all. And then uh, in the fall, we will be talking about autoimmune diseases. So lots of things coming up our way, really exciting stuff here. And, uh, and so now I'm going to uh, stop sharing my slide and just go and start to look at some of these questions that have been coming in. My my apologies, I'm not able to look at the questions and the presentation at the same time. I haven't quite figured that one out yet. So, um, and thanks for popping in those uh, registration links, Joanne, I appreciate it. Uh, so if you can please use the, the Q&A for, uh, for any questions and not the chat, uh, it's just easier for us to track it all in one spot. So let's see here. Um, Okay, so, so the minimum SPF level, most dermatologists are gonna say minimum that you should be going for is 30 and up. So uh, 30 is typically where you want to be. And it's a reapplication of honestly every two to three hours, not quite four hours. So um, let's see here, I gotta stop the share. There we go, okay. Um, and uh, how protective are contact lenses? That is a fabulous question. I have worn contact lenses since I'm 13, and that is not something I think I have ever asked my optometrist. Um, I can't give you the answer to that. I, and I would imagine that it would depend on the, the contact. I don't know how, um, you know, what type of protection is in the lenses. And there are so many different types of lenses. You've got toric, you've got the soft contacts, you've got hard contacts, there are lots of different types. So I'm not quite sure uh, on that one. When in doubt, you know, just 
grab a grab a pair of sunglasses. They don't even have to be super expensive, just you know, ones that have a good uh, UVA and UVB protection on them. Um, so the foods that contain uh, the polyphenols, uh, lycopenes and so on, so those are gonna be your oranges and your reds, uh, red foods. So those are gonna be things like tomatoes and uh, papaya, uh, you know, a lot of the things that are actually ripe and growing right now. And so, you know, uh, th those are the types that the EFAs are going to be things like salmon, uh, your, your kind of denser cold water fishes. Um, so those are the various different foods that will have the lycopenes in them. So yeah, bumping up your lycopenes, bumping up your antioxidants, uh, making sure that you're getting sufficient amounts of all of that in your diet is always a good idea. Um, let's see, how can you, can you please explain the connection between sun exposure and lupus nephritis. Um, that's actually not something that I am very well versed on. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to defer that one. If you want to send that via email, I can see, uh, if I can get some, somebody with a bit more, uh, experience in that topic to, to respond to, um, so the question about coconut oil in the shower. So, um, I don't use it in the shower. I use it after the shower. So you wash up, you get clean. Um, and then kind of as your moisturizer, I like coconut oil. Um, I, I kind of smell like a big old coconut afterwards for a little bit, but, um, it, it just, I, I think that it does a good job in moisturizing my skin. It doesn't tend to break me out, you know, and, and, skin is such a personal thing. People are, you know, some people's skin is very sensitive. Uh, you know, I started with, you know, using natural oils, uh, when I was pregnant and kind of just, you know, really, um, neurotic about not wanting to get stretch marks. And so I was like, just greasing myself up like big old watermelon. And, um, and I kept with it. And then when my son was born, um, uh, his skin was very sensitive. And so it was the sort of thing where, you know, I, I just stopped using, just keeping in the house, anything that was going to potentially cause a rash. So, uh, but some people don't like the heavy feeling of oils. Um, I personally do, my skin tends to dry. So some of this is going to vary depending on your skin type, your skin sensitivities, um, and so on. So, uh, but I, you know, I wouldn't advocate for keeping glass in the shower just from a safety perspective, because if it does, um, you know, and most of the coconut oils come in glass containers. So that just from a safety perspective, perspective, I wouldn't advocate for keeping glass inside the shower because if you drop that, then you got bra glass on the floor, not such a great idea. So um, anyway, let's see additional questions. Um, oh gosh, there are lots of questions coming in here. Um, so what types of sunscreens are considered natural? So really what you're looking for are substances that have not been created in a laboratory. Um, so the, the most common natural sunscreens are going to be your zinc, as I mentioned earlier, and your titanium dioxide. So um, some, some, uh, some sunscreens will have iron added to it, but in, in a nutshell, you really want to look for those physical barriers, not the chemical ones, not the ones that are chemically altering the UVA, uh, UVA wavelengths on your skin, but the ones that are just acting as a barrier. And because they're a barrier, you need to wear them a little bit thicker. And so some folks don't like the, um, the zinc ones because it is going to tinge your skin a little bit. So like first thing in the morning, I'm in Arizona, I put on a, a pretty substantial sunscreen, uh, zinc based, uh, sunscreen in the morning. And, and it does tinge my skin a little bit white. And so afterwards I put on like a tinted moisturizer or a foundation or something so that my skin doesn't <laughs> looks a little normal afterwards. So, but they make them now with tinted, you know, tint in it so that it, it is a little bit better. So there, there are so many different types on the market. Um, but I'm just a little neurotic because I, you know, I am getting older and I do have skin, uh, skin da sun damage on my skin. And so, um, I've already had a spot removed. And so I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I, I don't play around when it comes to that. So, um, but you know, in, in general, that's, that's where you're going to want to go for natural stuff. Um, so, uh, what advice do I have for students interested in naturopathic medicine? Um, it is an amazing field. There is, there are so many different options available to you as an ND. 
And, um, and it's really fun to see where the field is growing and expanding to. The one thing that I will say is be intentional about your plan. So think of any education as an investment, as an investment in yourself, in your career, in your future. Um, any, in the case of naturopathic medicine, I can definitively say I'm a healthier human because of what I've learned in medical school. Um, and so, you know, I don't know how you even put a price on that, but, um, you know, as far as people looking at a field, you know, talk to NDs, start to figure out how you want to use this degree. What do you want to do with it? Uh, do you want to cl practice clinically? What area of medicine? Where in the country? Where, where in the world? And so start to get a really clear sense of what that plan is. The successful students that I see have made a plan. Uh, they have gotten feedback on that plan. Very important. And, uh, you know, it often will have mentors or people to bounce things off of and, and they stick to it and they really plug away. Um, they're proactive. They don't wait for life to happen to them. They, they make it happen. Um, so th that's the advice that I would share. Um, let's see, are there any brands? Um, so I'm going to stick away from brands just because I don't want to be, um, coming across like I'm promoting any one brand over another. Hopefully I've given you enough tools so that when you're looking at the labels, uh, you can have a better sense of, okay, is there UVA and UVB protection in this sunscreen? Is this a physical barrier sunscreen? What are the active ingredients? What are the inert ingredients? You know, read that label list. And if there are lots of words with really, really, really long <laughs> syllables attached to them, um, is a good chance that there's, those are the chemical additives. Um, So uh, botanicals and homeopathic remedies that can help with skin protection. Um, honestly, you know, there, there are some, the literature is, is still developing. And so those are areas that I would, you know, just because the literature is still not fully fleshed out, I, I don't want to go there. You know, I talked a bit about, um, you know, kind of buffering your body from the inside out and making sure that you've got adequate antioxidants so that if there is some, you know, DNA damage that has been done on your cells from skin, some, from sun exposure, that your body has the ability to manage that, that DNA alter, altering and the damage that may have happened and fix those cells from the inside. So, you know, it's kind of an inside out approach, uh, to, to that. Um, Let's see here. So, um, so the question about tinted moisturizers. So again, most folks are just not going to be putting on enough. Uh, you know, you, you really have to, I hate to say it, you have to kind of, it's got to be like a good thick slather of, of that. So, you know, when you've got tinted moisturizers, I think a lot of them tend to go on pretty thin and, uh, you know, it, it, it is one of those things where like how much is, is enough. So I just always err on the side of, of being a little bit more protected than being less test your vitamin D levels regularly, you know, once or twice a year, uh, make sure we're, that they're at where they should be and then supplement accordingly. Um, it's, you know, it's a lot easier to supplement with a little bit of vitamin D than to deal with skin cancer, honestly. So, you know, that's just kind of the place I come from is, you know, this, this vitamin D supplementation is something we can easily do. Um, skin cancer is a pain in the tush to deal with, and you'd probably rather not have to have to deal with that one. Um, so let's see, I am going to be wrapping up in just a minute. Um, how do you take care of scars? So scars, uh, our skin that are healing and the, uh, melanin, if you've ever had scars, you know, some people, uh, develop, um, especially folks with, with more melanin in their skin might be prone to having keloids, which is a hyper, uh, proliferation of the tissue on the scar tissue. And so it might bubble up a little bit. Um, I actually have one on the back of my, uh, on my back, on my scapula from, a uh, 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 uh a little cyst that was taken out that kind of keloided over a little bit. Um, there are some things that, you know, conventionally that can be done to suppress keloid formation. Um, but in general, scar tissue is, is not going to be as melanated right away. And so it can be more vulnerable. Plus you want the body to be able to just heal without that overexposure of sun. And so it is a good idea to, uh, you know, cover up any areas, you know, first with clothing. Um, and then if clothing is not an option, uh, with, uh, you know, 
with some type of natural sunscreen that is not going to irritate, you know, obviously you don't want to be putting on sunscreen over an open cut. So, you know, if, if you have something that is open and actively healing, let it heal. Um, and then, you know, so keep it covered up and you wouldn't really want to be putting on anything over an actively open cut. Hope that makes sense. Um, do you need to use sunscreen in countries with less sun um, and who are indoors now? OK, so if you are a full hermit and you don't have windows in your room um, and, you know, you're not going outside at all, uh, then maybe you don't. But um, if you're going out at all, as I said earlier, the the UVA and the UVB is going to filter through um, through through the clouds you know, that is one of those myths that people think, oh, well, you know, it's, it's a cooler place. All you have to think of are, you know, somebody who's going skiing, right? So, you know, think of that person who's gone skiing, they're up on the mountain, most of their body is covered. And then when they take their goggles off, they've got this tan across their face. So what's happening in skiing is you're at higher elevation. Um, so you've got less of the, the actual physical barrier uh, between you and the sun. Um, you have sometimes the, the, the air, uh, and the concentration of things in the air, it's thinner. So it's easier to get sun sunburn higher up you go. So, you know, always, I always think of that skier who, where the, you know, they take off their goggles and they've got, you know, pretty dry, raw, red, reddish face. Um, and the, the air is also drier too. So, and that's breaking down the integrity, the dryness of the skin. So remember all of those factors that we're talking about with skin health. Um, so, Yes and no. So yes, you are going to still probably need some, uh, but again, it's going to depend on the amount that you're covered up and, uh, you know, and where you are. And so it, like, like I said, in the beginning, none of these are like really easy to answer questions that are going to be a one size fits all thing. Um, so uh, with that, I am going to wrap up today's webinar. Oh, one more uh, natural sunscreen should be used. So there isn't really, so vitamin D is not preventing or protecting your skin. Um, that, that is not, so vitamin D is synthesized from the sun in your skin, but it is not protecting your skin. Uh, melanin in your skin is going to protect someone from your UVB, UVA, you're on your own. So, uh, you know, I think that the natural sunscreens, again, I'm not going to be naming brands here, uh, you know, for not wanting to appear like we are. Uh, promoting any one product over another. Um, but, you know, really just look at your labels, the physical barriers or the, z the zinc and the titanium. Uh, most other things are going to be chemical. So, uh, you know, that's kind of your, your nutshell. So if you look at your, your, um, you know, your sunscreen, it, most of them are going to say mineral sunscreen. So mineral-based sunscreen. So that's really kind of the language that you're going to want to look for. Um, and then avoid those things like the oxybenzones and the avobenzones. Uh, if, you know, if you're trying to avoid more of the chemical, uh, components in the sunscreens. So with that, um, I hope that you all have a safe and sunny summer and, uh, and I've enjoyed this talk and I hope that you have as well. And so uh, lots, of, lots of good wishes to you all. And we are here at the ANMC if you have any additional questions. Thanks for coming. And uh, with that, we're gonna wrap up today. Hope to see you at one of our future events.